I'd like to introduce to you the man who is the leading light in the revolution that is UK, that is shaking up the political establishment across the north of England, a man who, as it's always said, needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you UKIP leader, Nigel Farage, MEP. to vote UKIP. So we've got some real momentum going behind our campaign. And I'm guessing that's why Chuck Ramuna said what he said yesterday. Did you hear it? He said that UKIP is a racist party. Uh, repeating that claim that we've heard so many times before that we know to be total and utter rubbish. We're a non-racist, non-sectarian party. We're not against anybody. We just think it's about time we started to put the interests of our own people first. So they decided that rather than going for the ball, they're going to go for the man. Well, I reckon they've got a lot to be scared about. Because when UKIP starts to get momentum in Labour constituencies, we've seen in the past just how quickly that can spread and what it means. And I think Labour voters in this and every other part of the country realise that it is Labour that was the party of mass immigration. Remember the comment, we're sending out the search parties. We want to rub the noses of the right in diversity. And of course it was Labour under Blair that opened up the door to eight and then ten former communist countries, all of which are allowed to come to Britain. And this process is not at an end, uh, because you'll notice that one of the other things that has happened is the, the tradition that Tony Blair started um, of going to war without thinking through what the consequences may be is something that this coalition picked up too. And in 2011, all three parties in Westminster decided that bombing Libya was a good idea. I, I'm very pleased to say uh, that neither Mark Reckless nor Douglas Carswell supported that. Uh, and I remember myself arguing in the European Parliament that to attempt to destabilise yet another country in the Middle East was madness, um, and so it's proved. Libya is now uh, basically a failed state that has now become a conduit for a mass criminal human trafficking operation. Um, and I'm going to Strasbourg tomorrow where there will be a debate about the Mediterranean crisis and where there will be a proposal on the table that says that we must now have a common European immigration and asylum policy. Now, what of course that means is that if millions of people come into Italy and come into Greece and are given EU passports, they will all be able to come here. And whilst I do feel a degree of guilt and culpability for what our country has done, and I do feel sorry for people living in countries that are in that mess, and I'd be more than happy for us to redirect part of our EU contribution or our foreign aid budget to help these people, the message I think that needs to come out loud and clear is we want no part of an EU common immigration and asylum policy and that we demand to know in the next 10 days what Ed Miliband or David Cameron will do in the face of this growing crisis. But on the ground, I think people here understand that uncontrolled immigration has depressed wages. It has put pressure on GP services, on accident and emergency services. It has led to a housing crisis. Now, I attempted to have this debate with Ed Miliband and Nicola Sturgeon the other day. I said, if, if, if an extra five million people have come into the country net since 1997, do you think that would have put pressure 
on the housing market? No, they all replied. I mean, even my nine-year-old daughter said, Daddy, if more people come to Britain, it means we need to build more houses, doesn't it? And actually, we need to build one new house every seven minutes just to cope with migration levels coming in to Britain today. Uh, and in many parts of the country, not so much here in the northeast, but in many other parts of the country, there is now a chronic shortage of primary school places just because of the rise in population. Uh, but of course, that's not really the view uh, in London. Um, and the view in London um, has always been that the North East is fine. The North East is secure. The North East is the one party state. The North East is a plaything where you can parachute in people who've probably never even visited the area on holiday before. And so you finish up, uh, not just with Mr. Blair, but you finish up with a Miller Band in South Shields. And, of course, most famously of all, a Mandelson in Hartlepool. Um, and they've got away with it for years. They've got away with it for years. But the lesson, of course, is this. Scotland was the, was the Labour one-party state for many years. And we've seen how the, how the SNP have managed to destroy that. So, you, you know, nothing is forever. And I also think it's worth people here in the North East remembering that when a Labour Party fights a general election campaign and one of their key targets is the cost of living crisis, we should remind ourselves that it was Ed Miliband, who was the Energy Secretary in 2008, who brought in the Climate Change Act and has added directly to everybody's electricity bill a surplus that will be 20% for the time of the 2020 general election. Now, my feeling is that the London-led Metropolitan Elite Labour Party have frankly betrayed working class people in this country and are no longer connected to them in any way at all. And I also remember, I'm just about old enough to remember, that the Labour Party used to be a patriotic political party. It used to be made up of men and women that had served in two world wars and really believed in the country. And, and, and that's why the Labour Party back in the 60s and 70s, said that Britain should never join the common market, that the common market would be wrong. In fact, Gateskill famously said in Scarborough that it would end a thousand years of independence. And yet it's that Labour Party today, under Ed Miliband, that has now you know, swallowed hook, line and sinker the big business corporate agenda as is dictated from Brussels. And Ed Miliband will not even give the British people the option in a referendum to decide their own future. So they've gone really a very long way, I think, from their roots and from their own supporters. And I think what's becoming increasingly clear is that Labour now could not form a government without the help of the Scottish National Party. And it, that really would constitute, I think, a very bad deal for England and Wales. In fact, we already have a bad deal for England and Wales. It's called the Barnet Formula. Now, I know I get into trouble in this particular part of the country, but most of England thinks that Hadrian's Wall is still the dividing line between England and Scotland. I know that one or two of you in the room will take objection to that comment, living in Northumberland. Um, but metaphorically speaking, Metaphorically speaking, Miliband, Clegg and Cameron, in an act of appeasement before the results came out of the Scottish referendum, all signed a pledge to say that they, in effect, in perpetuity, would maintain the Barnet formula. Uh, and in doing so, in doing so, they are guaranteeing a bad deal for the English. The only party that actually will put up a proper opposition to the SNP and say that they need to learn the economic facts of life and that it's wholly unacceptable for English taxpayers' money to go on subsidising free prescription charges and no tuition fees is indeed UKIP. So if you want to stop a Labour-SNP coalition, then Labour voters in the north of England need to go out and vote for UKIP. That is the way we stop that coalition from happening. And I do think... Uh, that actually, in the North, in particular, the Labour vote is incredibly soft. You know, it's, it's, it's rather like a rotten window frame. 
All we have to do is to push and the whole thing caves in. And we've seen this over the last few years, starting with the Barnsley by-election, going on indeed to the Middlesbrough by-election, going on to the extraordinary South Shields by-election, where with almost no notice at all, UKIP began a surge and got 26% of the vote. And then, of course, just across the other side, in Haywood and Middleton last September, despite the fact the opinion polls the weekend before were saying that we were 20 points behind, we came within 617 votes of beating Labour in one of their safest seats. Now, there's an awful lot talked about opinion polls, an awful lot talked about constituencies, and an awful lot talked about UKIP's prospects. But let me say this to you. Eight of the last nine national opinion polls that have come out in the last week have shown affirming of UKIP support. We are up roughly 2% in the last 10 to 12 days, and the Labour Party is down 2% in the last 10 to 12 days, and there is a direct correlation. So it is in areas like this that actually we have our greatest level of anticipation and excitement. And indeed in a seat here like Hartlepool, where UKIP has been around for a long time, has won at council level and is fighting under a good candidate, a strong campaign. You know, we are in this and several other constituencies in with a chance of winning. I also think we'll come second in virtually all of the others, which long term, thinking ahead to 2020, uh, means an awful lot. But I don't want us in these last 10 days uh, to go out in Hartley Port and elsewhere and to say to people that we're looking for a protest vote. This is not a protest vote. Because many of those people who vote for us here and across the rest of the United Kingdom, yes, some of them will have come from the Tory party, from the Lib Dems and from Labour. But everybody's forgetting in this, in this election there's an even bigger constituency out there, and that's the 40% of people who didn't vote for anybody in the last election and who feel so disenchanted and cut off from career politics, they haven't been engaging and they haven't been bothering. They're not going to vote for UKIP as a protest, but they will come out and vote for UKIP if they see us as a party that is offering genuine hope. Hope that we can actually make the lives of ordinary people better. A patriotic political party that says that unashamedly and wants Britain's relationship with the EU to be based on trade, friendship, cooperation, but for us to govern our own country, have our own democracy and re-engage with the Commonwealth and many other parts of the world. A, a, a party that offers hope on housing, because we're the only people that recognise that if you control the demand side of the equation, by having an Australian-style point system, we won't need to build so many houses for new migrants coming into Britain, and that we're the ones actually that have got a radical plan for brownfield building to build 200,000 affordable homes every single year. A party that believes there should be no tax on the minimum wage to give people real incentives to get off benefit and to get back to work. And a party that believes that experienced nurses and, and, and experienced policemen who've been dragged into the 40p tax ban without being particularly high earners actually should get a tax cut down to 30p. So we're the party of low tax. We're the party saying to people at the lower and middle ends of the income scale, we would cut your taxes and give you and, and, and make working you know, a very much bigger incentive for you. And a party that believes in cheaper energy bills. We don't think that everybody paying a 20% surcharge makes sense on their bills. And what hope does it give heavy manufacturing in the north of England when actually energy is probably in many cases an even more significant bill than wages in terms of the profitability and the viability of those businesses? And a party that has thought about some of the social issues, a party that has understood that the bedroom tax has caused great misery and great unhappiness to huge numbers of people in this country. A party that has thought about the particular problem that many women face, where well, they suddenly find their retirement age that they'd expected has gone up very rapidly. And only UKIP is actually putting on the table a flexible package for retirement 
so that some women will not have to wait all those extra years and could take a slightly reduced pension earlier. It's a party that wants a fair deal for England. It's a party that is unashamed to be English as well as British. You will not see me tweeting any pictures of white vans with Cross of St George's in a derogatory way. We have got 10 days to go in this general election campaign. Every attempt has been made to talk down our expectations. Every attempt has been made to squeeze the UKIP vote. But I think there is a misunderstanding amongst our political classes and some of our media classes that actually people who vote UKIP do so because they believe in what we stand for. And that if more people out there can see in some of these northeast constituencies that we are the challengers to Labour, that we are the only people that can beat Labour in these constituencies, then I think we may also get some tactical voting because the only truly wasted vote in the northeast of England is a Conservative vote. So I want to come back here in a few weeks' time when we've broken through won our first seats in Parliament from this part of the world, come second elsewhere, and are preparing ourselves to be the biggest party in the North East by 2020. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> you some questions? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, lovely. Thank you.